Hello, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you live. I am Pascal Chariot, I'm the CEO of NR Data, and I just would like to welcome you uh, for this webinar, which is the, the third uh, of a series of four conferences we are having. We are celebrating today, or this year, the 30 years anniversary of NR Data. And by the way, we are very happy to have one of the founders of NR Data today with us, with Bruno Lapillon. And, and we use this event of the 30 years to, to look back at what has been happening during the last 30 years and what might be happening in the next 30 years. So we have organized this set of four conferences. Uh, the first one was the global approach and the global economy, population, energy transition as such. Then last week, we had a focus on the energy systems on the supply side of fossil fuels, uh, renewables, etc. Today we will focus on the demand side with the dream team of the demand side we have today uh, gathered. And next week we will have the last conference which will focus on the role of different organizations, not only the, the country level uh, on which we will be focusing uh, again more today, but on what the local authorities, the companies and so on are, and the citizens at the end of the day are part of in terms of changes. So you may um, look, uh, you the replay uh, facility to, to look at the previous conferences, which last about one hour each of them. And today we will uh, look at the demand side uh, live. So welcome again, and thank you to all the speakers that we have invited that have prepared this meeting today. Thank you. And I will begin, sorry, introducing Marie Rousselot, who will be chairing this conference today. Marie is the head of our energy efficiency and demand team, and she will facilitate this conference today. Thank you, Pascal. I'm very happy to host this round table, the third one. Um, today, um, I'm delighted also uh, to have uh, many speakers about this roundtable. Um, the speaker topics will be about the concept of energy efficiency and the multiple benefits in the North and in the South, the recent energy efficiency trends in Europe and Latin America, and the challenges these two regions face to further reduce their energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions some examples of energy policies being implemented and how they may conflict with the achievement of poverty reduction and decarbonization objectives, the transitions to 2050 scenarios proposed by ADEM, the French um, Agency for Environment and Energy, and uh, different possible futures for French society based on contrasting lifestyles and energy demand. So I would like to welcome all of you because uh, I've seen that there are many people from all around the world. It's sometimes very early for some of you or very late in the evening. Thank you for being, um, for joining us again. During the, the round table, you will be able to ask your questions in the Q&A box on your screen. So don't hesitate to do that. And we'll have about 30 minutes presentations from our speakers that will be followed by about 30, 40 minutes uh, roundtable and discussions uh, where I will pick up the questions from the floor. Um, and we should end up this roundtable at about 1.15 uh, French time. So in about um, one and an, um, 15 uh, minutes. So today's we have uh, for the moment three <laughs> Three speakers, I hope the, the fourth one will uh, join. Uh, we have Laura Sudahies, who is project manager uh, at the Energy Efficiency and Demand, de Demand Department uh, at NR Data. She works in particular on energy efficiency indicators and energy efficiency progress measurements. We are also happy to welcome Bruno Lapion, with a who is a co-founder and scientific director at Enadata. He has a large experience on energy demand analysis and forecasting, as well on the evaluation of energy efficiency measures and policies. We should have Wolfgang that will join, hopefully. Uh, we hope there is no um, yeah, problem on his side. He's head of the Competence Center for uh, Energy Policy and Energy Markets at Fraunhofer Institute. Um, this is uh, Institute for System and Innovation Research, one of the leading institu institutes of that kind in Europe. 
Bob Gong is a physicist with professional experience gathered in various countries of the European Union and also worldwide in designing and evaluating energy efficiency and renewable policies, as well as climate policies. And last but not least, we welcome also Valérie Kinyo Ramu, who is the Executive Director of the Prospective and Research Department at ADEM, so the French Agency for Ecological Transition. She contributes to the agency expertise on climate change adaptation and mitigation. And she also co-led the development of the ADEM transitions scenarios that were published at the end of 2021 and that she will present us. So we have around this table, very um, people with their very contrasted profiles and I'm sure uh, we will have a very interesting debate about this topic. Let's now start the presentations. And after that, I will take uh, questions from the floor. Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mary, and good morning and good afternoon to everyone. I'm very happy to, to be part of this conference in the framework of the 30th anniversary of Enadata. So to introduce this conference, I will, um, I will try to define what is behind the concept of energy efficiency. And I would like to start with a short story. Let's back to the 70s when we started hearing about energy efficiency. Uh, during this period, we had the first oil shock, the first energy access crisis, and um, policymakers started to think on how we can reduce energy consumption to be less dependent on fossil fuel. Uh, this period coincides with the thesis of Bruno Lapierre and Bertrand Chateau on energy demand modeling and forecasting. So there is a direct link with Ena data because uh, after some years of research, they uh, co-founded Ena data. And since that, we are helping policymakers in assessing energy efficiency. So what we call energy efficiency nowadays. Energy efficiency progress is seen as the reduction of the energy consumption to satisfy a given service. Uh, for example, a given, given indoor temperature level or a given industrial uh, production. And this through different types of consumer actions. Uh, as an example, when you insulate your uh, dwelling uh, is uh, an efficient action. Also, when you um, replace your old uh, refrigerator with a new one and more efficient one. But also when you use a bus instead of your own car to go at work uh, while traveling the same distance. And uh, many other actions uh, like uh, behavior actions, like turning off the light when it's not necessary as seen uh, as efficient actions. However, uh, when you change the indoor temperature level, for example, um, from 19 degrees to 17 degrees, is not seen as efficiency, but more as sufficiency. But we will talk about sufficiency also a little bit in this conference. So <clears throat> the need for policymakers is to assess energy efficiency progress and energy savings. <clears throat> Sorry, and to do that, we use energy efficiency indicators. But Monitoring energy efficiency at very macro level, at national level, is not an easy task. Why? Many countries use a very macro level, uh, such as energy intensity or energy consumption variation, to uh, assess energy efficiency progress and also to set national targets. Um, why? Because these type of indicators are very easy because they require uh, few data, so they are very easy to calculate. But the problem is that they may be influenced by many other factors than energy efficiency. For example, in the case of the industrial sector, uh, we may have uh, um, energy efficiency uh, progress uh, with more efficient technology and processes. But at the same time, if we have a higher growth of energy intensive products, it may not be seen at the industrial level um, because of this uh, factor, because of these structural changes. 
So this is why we need um, appropriate methods and indicators to properly assess energy efficiency progress. Um, as I, as I, I give an example here of the decomposition of industry consumption variation over 2000-2019, uh, we can see that structural changes play an important role in the consumption variation in the EU. So this is the purpose of the project Odyssey Mirror in New York, where in Enerdata is pa participating since more than 20 years. And Enerdata is a technical coordinator of the Odyssey database, uh, gathering more than several hundred of uh, data and indicators on energy efficiency at very detailed level. And through this project, we develop methodologies to help countries on uh, the assessment of energy efficiency. And these methodologies uh, are being used by many stakeholders, and in particular, the European Commission. So before uh, going in, in more details on some insights of energy efficient trends in North and South countries, I would like to, sh to, to share you the multiple benefits of energy efficiency. Um, there are many uh, benefits that are in common in both uh, North and South countries. Uh, obviously, when you save energy, you, you can save money. You save money uh, in the level of uh, industries, um, which uh, increase their competitiveness and their productivity. But also, we, you, you can reduce the import uh, fuel uh, bills of economies. And also, you can reduce the energy expenditures of households, and it can have an impact on the energy poverty. Uh, obviously, if you save energy, you save emissions. So you save emissions from fuel combustion, but also uh, indirect emissions uh, from power generation. And if we look at some benefits uh, which are specific to South countries, uh, for example, on energy access, uh, if you uh, use less energy, then you can power um, energy to more uh, people through the existing energy infrastructure. And also uh, improving energy efficiency can improve the climate change resilience of uh, South economies. Because if, for example, you have uh, uh, well insulated dwellings, then uh, the energy needs um, which are um, exposed to extreme weather conditions uh, are reduced also. So, <clears throat> yes, I will not go into uh, all the detail of uh, multiple benefits, but yes, we have many. And now I will, uh, we, you, we will continue uh, this conference by going in more details on energy efficient trends in North and South country. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, we will have time for questions about the multiple benefits if you want to detail it more. And we now are happy to hear uh, Bruno's presentation. Bruno, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, so I will uh, continue with uh, more concrete results, but brief results about uh, what's going on in Europe. And uh, as an example of uh, South country, we took the example also of Latin America because Enerdata has been coordinating for uh, 10 years, the project sponsored by ADEM and AFD and the uh, UN CEPAL. Uh, looking at energy efficiency trend in Latin America, which is uh, very similar to what we have been doing in Europe. Let's start with Europe first. Um, this graph shows you the trends in energy efficiency progress for the different sectors that are shown by color, and the total uh, trend is shown by the purple uh, line. Here we, we show an indicator that uh, we call ODEX, the Odyssey Energy Efficiency Index, that is a better indicator to capture uh, change in energy efficiency than energy intensity related to GDP. And this indicator takes into account uh, the energy efficiency progress at end use level or at type of uh, different types of vehicles, industrial branches, and so on. So at quite a detailed level. And all this is aggregated, taking into account the share of each uh, subsector and use in the total. 
What we uh, find out here is that energy efficiency has improved by 19% between 2000 and 2019. And this can be translated into in terms of energy savings. And we estimated uh, that 200 million ton oil equivalent have been saved uh, over this period, which means that in 2019, Without all these energy efficiency improvements, the uh, final energy consumption would have been 200 million ton oil equivalent higher. What is interesting is that uh, a great share of this uh, saving comes from household, 40%, whereas household represent a, a much lower share of the uh, total consumption. Well, this is mainly due to the fact that it is a sector where there has been a lot of measures uh, related to uh, energy efficiency in building with appliances, uh, most of them implemented at EU level, but complemented with uh, national measures. Uh, this is the good uh, news. The bad news is that uh, since, uh, well, I don't know why it has changed. Since um, in 2014, uh, we see a slowdown in the energy efficiency progress, uh, which has uh, gone down from 1.2% per year annual improvement to 0.7% per year since 2014. So it's almost twice slower since 2014 and uh, twice slower for households and cars. For households, um, if we look at uh, the detail, uh, this mainly comes from space heating. Uh, which represent about 70% of the total consumption of households. And there are different factors that may uh, explain this slowdown, but we don't have a quantitative uh, exp explanation, quantification of the role of these different factors. First of all, we are building less new dwellings, and these new dwellings are much more efficient than the average of the stock. So these contribute to, uh, to slow down the progress. Second, we think that there might be some quality issues in the renovation or in the, in the construction. We have very severe um, standard for new buildings, but that may be uh, not well respected once the buildings are built. Third, um, one, one part of the progress we have uh, recorded in the past was due to the diffusion of a very efficient heating appliance like condensing boiler and when all the uh, dwellings are equipped, of course, uh, there is some kind of saturation and there is less progress. And the fourth factor, which is a more difficult to quantify, is the rebound effect. The fact that consumer uh, will eat more their uh, dwellings, have more comfort, and of course, this uh, limits uh, the energy efficiency progress. In Latin America, um, the, the situation is a bit different. Uh, the countries have been embarked more recently in energy efficiency policies. And of course, the energy efficiency progress is uh, less visible than in European countries that have a long experience of policy measures. This is a general view. There are some countries in Latin America uh, which are very active and have a, a comprehensive set of energy efficiency measures. What we can see is that uh, half of the countries have improved their energy efficiency since 2010, which means the other half did not improve their energy efficiency. Whereas in Europe, uh, energy efficiency improvement is uh, seen in all the country. Uh, what is the uh, characteristics of uh, Latin American countries uh, is that uh, uh, the, the main effort in terms of policy measures have been in the household sector where three-fourths of the countries have implemented energy efficiency labels and energy efficiency standards for refrigerator, washing machine, air conditioner, and so on. It's a bit similar to Europe in the sense that a lot of measures have been targeting the household sector, but this situation is even more significant in Latin America. What we observe that is typical of Latin America and also a lot of southern countries is that the average consumption per household is decreasing, despite the increase in income of the people. 
This is mainly due that most of the consumption, if we look at the total consumption, uh, fuel and electricity, is uh, linked to cooking in most countries. This is a dominant end use. And efficiency is improving because biomass is being replaced by uh, modern fuels. Uh, of course, the measures that have been implemented for all solar appliance only have an impact on the electricity, which represents a smaller share of the consumption of household. For road transport, which uh, is an important uh, end use, represents about 35% uh, of the consumption, there have been significant energy efficiency improvement above 2% per year in half of the countries. This is probably a benefit of uh, the standards that have been implemented in uh, uh, most uh, OECD countries. And the technology is imported in these countries. The next slide, uh, which is a conclusion, look at the main cha challenge for energy efficiency. In transport, the main challenge, we know how to improve the efficiency of vehicles, of cars, there are measures to do it. But one thing that did not work, especially in, in Europe, but even worse in the, in the other region, is uh, reducing the importance of road transport, which is much more energy intensive than the rail transport or water transport. In Europe, there are a lot of intention to reduce the share of road transport. But when we look at the indicators, the actual share of cars or trucks in the traffic of passengers and goods, we see that at European level, it did not change much over the last 20 years. In Latin, in Latin America, uh, the situation is even worse because there is a lack of rail infrastructure. So for the moment, only uh, Road transport is the alternative for uh, moving passenger or, or uh, goods. And changing that implies long, uh, large invest investment, which means long lead time. For households, the challenge uh, everywhere is to uh, reduce the energy bill and increase in comfort. Um, and there are two alternatives energy efficiency and energy substitutions. In Europe, the main issue is we have a lot of measure for appliances for new buildings and uh, the uh, remaining uh, area where we have to increase the effort is for retrofitting uh, housing with uh, more uh, efficient existing dwellings. In Latin America, uh, the main issue is to reduce the energy use for cooking which means to continue switching from traditional fuel to modern fuel. This is an important impact. And probably also to develop the use of electricity uh, for cooking, which is uh, something that is promoted in uh, uh, some countries already. Uh, and it is a way to uh, use renewable if electricity is produced from renewable for cooking. Uh, there are some regions with large heating and cooling needs in uh, South Europe and in the north of South Europe in Mexico, where uh, there are large heating and cooling needs and the issues are very similar to what we see in Europe. And to conclude, uh, in industry, uh, there are less measures, uh, and this is true in Europe and Latin America, and the uh, energy efficiency investment are driven by market forces. Uh, and the regulation. That is to say market forces at industry uh, tend to uh, have more efficient equipment in their factories. And what is interesting is that the most efficient plant in the world are not longer seen in Europe or in OECD countries, but in the southern countries. I thank you for your attention and uh, I will come back for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruno. We are very happy to uh, see Wolfgang. Wolfgang, happy to see you. You can take the control of the presentation if you want. And the floor is yours for eight minutes. Okay. Yeah. Can you just recall me to, to take eye of your options? Okay. Here, I'll, I'll, and then a request remote control. Okay. Here you are. Very good. Hope it works. Uh, so um, yeah, um, 
uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Um, and it's also a pleasure for me uh, to wish a happy birthday um, to Anna Data uh, for 30 years. And it's also 30 years of uh, cooperation, uh, which we had uh, uh, with Anna Data on various uh, projects over the last uh, uh, these last three three decades, and in particular, we were uh, very much uh, pleased to cooperate with Enerdata for so much uh, a period of time uh, uh, on the Odyssey Mu project uh, for energy efficiency indicators and energy efficiency uh, policies, which has become uh, really a, a major project within the European Union. But as Bruno has shown, uh, is also very very relevant uh, beyond uh, Europe which inspired other, other regions in particular. Uh, now, let me see whether I can move on to the next slide. Uh, no, uh, maybe, oh yeah, it does work, okay, yeah. Um, after these uh, brief congratulations, uh, let me have a look at um, uh, world uh, scenarios for climate neutrality. And uh, in fact, uh, these scenarios have been set up by, um, uh, Arena, which is an, uh, as you most of you know, uh, renewable energy agency, and you see the original um, scenarios on, on the left hand side, and what um, energy transition uh, strategy to come to climate neutrality, and well, um, you expect from Arena that is a renewable energy uh, agency that. Um, at first place, um, they see naturally uh, the contribution that comes from renewable energy sources, 25% to reach climate neutrality. But you see at the same level uh, also energy conservation and energy efficiency and both pillars together uh, or both component percent uh, to the target um, of climate neutrality. We have other four components, um, which are a bit less uh, important, uh, but um, from the other ones, especially the electrification in end use sectors is, is very important, direct electric uses, for example, for transport, um, which also is in a, kind, uh, in a way um, uh, energy efficiency comp contribution because um, uh, electric um, drives, for example, are much more efficient then uh, thermal uh, drives, for example, in cars, they are two to three times uh, more efficient. Um, also, we have other components here, which are uh, very strongly discussed uh, at present, sometimes um, very prominently, like, for example, hydrogen and its derivatives, like syn synthetic met methane, or synthetic gasoline, and so on. Um, and you see in this presentation of the scenarios for ARENA, the contribution is smaller compared to the three other components I already mentioned. Oh, carbon capture and storage in industry uh, makes an even smaller contribution and still important is the contribution of um, bioenergy in combination with carbon capture and storage, which makes in a way negative uh, emissions. So, you see this strength from uh, Arena on the left hand side, and on the right hand side, I made my own ranking uh, from what I see um, uh, as, as the most important contribution. And in many countries, you talk about renewables, and they surely have to make a very important contribution. But very importantly, is to put energy efficiency at the first place. And for that, in European Union, um, the, the, the term energy I think we lost uh, Wolfgang. Wolfgang. Yeah, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, Wolfgang, maybe you, you could uh, turn off your uh, your video. This would Im Im improve the connection. Okay, maybe that's, that's good. Yeah, sorry, sorry for that. Um, so just switching off the video. So. Um, uh, the energy efficiency um, as a first contributor is, is very important because um, it makes um, uh, less use of uh, resources, less use uh, of space and so on. This is why even renewables have to be used first because uh, the uh, efficiency of hydrogen production is less than the direct use of renewables and so on. 
Uh, let me see whether it works with the next slide. Yeah. Um, now in the Odyssey Muir uh, project, uh, we have been uh, taking care a lot of uh, energy efficiency measures, and it is very important to us to understand the impact of energy efficiency measures. And uh, worldwide, um, there was a success uh, story, let's say, in particular from energy efficiency standards and laboring programs. In, in Europe, there are large uh, programs um, that cover uh, a, a very uh, great number of uh, energy consumption uh, groups. Uh, and also all the countries that you see here have very important uh, programs for energy efficiency standards and, and labeling. Nevertheless, you can see that there are strong differences across the countries with respect to the success of these uh, measures and with respect to their contribution to reduce uh, electricity consumption over time. And it's very important to understand why such differences arise and how can we uh, better improve uh, the programs to cope with the uh, local, uh, regional or national uh, requirements uh, and how we can make a success out of the out of these um, uh, programs. Let me go to the next uh, slide. Um, I hope it yeah it changes. Um, uh, on 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 the side of Fraunhofer, um, we had a, uh, promoted a very successful instruments, uh, so-called learning energy efficiency networks uh, or climate networks in industry. Uh, and I think the, the, the father of these net networks uh, is also listening to this uh, contribution, Ebert Jochem. Um, he brought this instrument from Switzerland um, to uh, Germany and to an, uh, a number of other countries. And essentially, energy efficiency networks for industry, they comprise uh, 15 to 20 companies who set themselves uh, common energy efficiency targets uh, and have a regular monitoring pro process over a number of years. And overall, um, this leads to a doubling of uh, energy efficiency improvement as compared to uh, companies who work uh, uh, alone. And you see here on the right hand side that this instrument uh, has been spreading out and investigated in a number of countries. Um, I personally worked with colleagues in, in, in China on the introduction of these uh, networks and other companies, uh, other colleagues uh, have been working in other uh, countries in the world. Uh, and this instrument is, as I said, successful, but on the other hand, uh, when you experience uh, the differences uh, in the approach to industrial energy efficiency in different countries, you see that it's very important to understand how such an instrument uh, can cope with the requirements that are present in, in the country. China at the beginning was very rapid in introducing such energy efficiency networks, which are very successful, as said, uh, in Europe, uh, but then had a period of time where the impact of these uh, networks was, was very slow and the development uh, did not really advance. And in recent times, since uh, China has introduced uh, a climate reduction target or climate neutrality target, they again take up this, this idea and look more into detail how this can be made a success also in, in China. Uh, Finally, coming to the last slide, very successful group of, of instruments are carbon pricing uh, in the form of uh, carbon taxes, but also in the form of emission trading schemes. Uh, for the latter, again, a different number of regions are advancing for emission trading scheme. Europe has the emission trading scheme since 2005. Um, China has introduced at least partially for the electricity uh, sector South Korea has introduced such a scheme, Australia, US in some parts. So this is an instrument uh, which is moving forward. Um, but here again, uh, there are a number of caveats or, or of problems to be overcome, in particular in countries with poorer population where any increase in energy, in energy prices leads to quite a lot of uh, distributional problems in, in those countries. With that, I would like to, to stop my presentation here, and um, I hope that we can come back to these points in the course of the discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Wolfgang. Now, the floor is yours, Valérie. Yes, thank you. Let me up 
25. Yes. Uh, so you, yes, good morning or good afternoon to uh, to everybody. And um, uh, to start with, I would like to to thank um, NR Data uh, for inviting me uh, to this uh, opportunity. Uh, to share the results of our work. And uh, it's quite funny because uh, NR Data is 30 year old and uh, actually ADEM, uh, the French uh, uh, public agency for the ecological transition that I'm representing is also 30 years old uh, and we will celebrate that uh, next week. And uh, just to think about 30 years, it's also what separates us from uh, 2050. Uh, so three decades, uh, I don't know if uh, in our data uh, thinks that it's long uh, or short, but in any case, it's uh, a, a relatively brief period of time in, a, in anyone's uh, life, and uh, there is not much ahead of us to act. And um, so the purpose of my presentation will, uh, will be to, to show you uh, the types of scenarios that we've been working on uh, during the past uh, couple of years uh, in order to provide some uh, uh, tools uh, for France to act uh, towards this uh, uh, carbon neutrality in, two in 2050. So um, first, uh, um, uh, maybe a relatively long introduction on this slide. Uh, to uh, clarify the objectives of uh, our work. Uh, we wanted to build uh, scenario profiles that are internally consistent. Uh, we wanted to illustrate uh, the range of uh, long-term options uh, for achieving carbon neutrality and to explore the various implications for France. Um, for that, we also wanted to provide information for essential decisions to be made in the short term, because indeed, again, uh, it's making decisions now for uh, the next uh, three decades. And, and last, to bring factual information into the debate on the eve of the 2022 French presidential election, and also before the collective deliberations on the next uh, French uh, strategy on energy and climate. So our work consisted in um, developing four scenarios uh, corresponding to four visions of society, four lifestyles, different lifestyles, and four le levels of demand. Uh, and why four? Uh, because we wanted to reproduce the logical approach of the IPCC 1.5 degree special report, where also four uh, different types of society are represented for the world, and here decline for uh, France. Uh, our work wanted to be complete in terms of uh, considering all energy demand and by also. Um, uh, not ruling out uh, any uh, technical solution. Uh, we wanted to, to keep a high degree of interdependence between sectors um, and giving each scenario a solid and consistent, coherent uh, structure. We also used um, a multi-criteria comparison between these scenarios, including techno-economic, social and environmental factors. And in particular, new parameters such as uh, biomass use, uh, consumption of irrigation water, construction material, etc. And it took us about two years of work, of work, of work sorry, uh, involving um, about a hundred of uh, our experts, uh, holding also external discussions, discussions, uh, and together with uh, a scientific committee. Um, to be able to challenge uh, our work. So here on this slide, uh, you can see the four scenarios uh, that we've been working on. And just before uh, briefly presenting them, uh, just um, I give you um, a sense of the logic uh, be behind uh, those four scenarios. Uh, the first S1 and S2 scenarios uh, use uh, more of the lever of uh, energy sufficiency, while uh, S3 and S4 uh, use more of the lever of um, technology. Energy efficiency um, that we've been uh, talking about before 
uh, is used mainly in our three scenarios and a bit less in our four scenarios. Our four scenarios also differ in terms of governance. Uh, you have a much more local governance in uh, our first two, while we are more in a kind of national or even international governance system on the last two. And we'll see that uh, environmental impacts also grow from, from the first to the fourth scenarios. So uh, briefly now to, to present you those uh, three, uh, sorry, four scenarios with some keywords uh, presented here. So S1 is basically a society which is in search of meaning and which acts mainly on its lifestyles and consumption uh, patterns to achieve carbon neutrality. And the key ideas turn around uh, strong change in diets. Uh, we eat something like um, uh, three, um, three times less of meat. Organic food is widespread. Uh, building development is mainly in medium-sized or even in rural to towns. Uh, there is uh, very few new constructions, uh, but in, on the other hand, uh, massive renovation and also reassignment of building uses. Mobility is back to uh, proximity, which means that uh, lifestyles, uh, work, shopping, everything is also adapted to that. And basically there is less consumption um, and as a consequence, less industrial production, but it's more made in France and it's also more low tech, which is preferred uh, for better re repairability. In this uh, first scenario, only uh, the use of natural sinks is necessary to achieve carbon neutrality. For our second uh, scenario, which is called regional cooperation, um, we have here a shared governance to find practical solutions to achieve carbon neutrality. Consumption is also becoming more measured, uh, like in um, the first scenario. It's more responsible and sharing is becoming more widespread. But basically, uh, the lever of uh, uh, sufficiency is less uh, activated than in uh, S1. Diets are less transformed. Uh, but however, there, there is still uh, more local consumption, which is accompanied by public policies to uh, um, facilitate short uh, circuits, for instance. Medium-sized cities are preferred, uh, but here um, it's, it's also more pooling of equipment, which is common. Uh, the industry is supported to decarbonize and some sectors are re-industrialized in connection with the territories. Um, circular economy is also promoted in this uh, scenario and basically the energy consumption is uh, uh, decreased by a uh, factor of two between uh, today and, and uh, 2050 um, and the, um, the greenhouse gases emissions are uh, well decreased and as a consequence in addition to the natural sinks only a little use of carbon capture and, and storage is required. More quickly now for our uh, last two scenarios. Um, the third is um, oriented on technology. Technology and digital are present everywhere. Um, diets evolve, um, but less than in the first uh, two scenarios. In this scenario, we have um, an extensive exploitation of biomass for energy culture through uh, meat, um, meat and, uh, methanizer, uh, biofuels. There is also, as a consequence, an in intensified uh, forest use. Uh, big cities are expanding. It's a bit like today. And in this scenario, we have a favored uh, system of deconstruction and new construction approach in order to achieve uh, the best performance, uh, energy performance uh, quick, quickly. Um, mobility increases like today, um, but it's uh, electrified. Um, and, uh, and also there is a, a digital support for car sharing. Uh, industry uh, decarbonize, electrifies, and, um, and there is a use of uh, hydrogen, but which is partly imported. In this scenario, energy uh, consumption decreases, but not as much as the, in the first two. 
and there is a, a strong use of um, uh, carbon capture and storage and also of bioenergy uh, CCS. In the fourth scenario, basically current, current lifestyle continues. And to make the, the, the story short, uh, it's basically like today with uh, consumption increasing. And in summary, we have to repair uh, the impact um, on environment. And in particular, um, as energy consumption doesn't decrease much, greenhouse gas uh, emissions also uh, decrease, but not enough. Uh, and we need a lot of uh, uh, technical uh, things, uh, CCS, but also bioenergy CCS, and even uh, direct air CCS, uh, which in principle uh, uh, will capture uh, CO2 uh, directly in the atmosphere, which is uh, a technology not mature today. Um, so some key learnings, um, and amongst which um, uh, this one, which, uh, which is about carbon neutrality, which is possible, but it's a difficult road. Um, so you can see uh, how um, it, uh, our four scenarios um, uh, differ in terms of, uh, of energy consumption. Um, basically, um, our key message here is that we, we must act immediately uh, because both the social and technological transformation to be carried out uh, uh, are quite complicated, complex and need action today. Achieving neutrality uh, demands, uh, demands um, major human or technological uh, gambles, or maybe uh, a combination of the two. And in our opinion, um, uh, two scenarios uh, appear more risky. The first, which we called uh, frugal generation, because uh, uh, highly, uh, I mean, the risk is to, to have highly socially divisive. Yes. There are one to two minutes uh, left. Left, so yes, yes, no you. worries. Yeah. Um, the, the first, yes, because um, frugality may be not uh, desirable. And the fourth, because um, uh, there is a risk of uh, technological feasibility with uh, carbon storage. And, oops. Yeah, and um, we will, we also would like to, um, to put some issues for debate and in particular about uh, energy sufficiency and how far it can go. Um, basically, uh, sufficiency collides with the dominant mode of uh, consumerist uh, thinking that we can see today. Um, and, and some people believe that uh, it, it is possible to, uh, to, to act on sufficiency. Others may not find it uh, as uh, evident. And in any case, uh, sufficiency needs some debate and cannot be dissociated from the question of inequality. So, and maybe that, that is actually my conclusion um, uh, of, of this presentation that uh, we would like to have a debate today about uh, how far we can go on sufficiency. And um, you can find on our website uh, all the documents uh, and some of them uh, being in English uh, to provide you with more details. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Valérie. Um, it's not time for uh, questions. Um, there are many questions from the floor about the differences uh, between northern and southern countries. Um, I will try to summarize them, but maybe a first uh, question to you, Laura, is um, do you manage to collect the data all over the world? Are there regions that are better covered than others? Um, and what if some data are missing? What kind of data are missing in the different uh, regions of the world? Yes. Thank you for your question, Mari. Um, actually, obviously, um, North countries have um, a large set of uh, data already, and so we are able to calculate uh, very detailed indicators. Uh, in some South countries also, we have some data, uh, but uh, we suffer um, more for, from a lack of, of data, um, and especially uh, at very detailed level. 
um, I can take an example, um, uh, and also it depends on the sectors. Um, for example, uh, for the industry sector, uh, in both and north countries, there is um, almost no challenge because we already have um, in most of countries data by industrial branch uh, and also data on um, in most country on physical production. So we are able to calculate unit consumption by branch. Um, but if we take the transport sector, then it's more complicated because we, we would like to have some data, for example, on the stocks of vehicles. Um, and in some countries, especially in South uh, region, uh, these data are not um, available from official uh, stat statistics. We have more data on the sales of, of vehicles, but not on the stock. And if we look at data um, on energy consumption disaggregated by um, subsector, for example, the transport sector by uh, type of vehicle for cars, for trucks, etc., then this kind of data can be available for only one year for, from a survey or from a study. Uh, but not for all years. And so Enadata um, has developed methodology to help um, national teams in the estimation of uh, this kind of data. And this methodology has been used in Odyssey, but also in Latin, Latin America in the project that uh, Bruno mentioned previously. Marie, we cannot hear you. Thank you. <laughs> it, it should happen to one time. Um, I said that in the, the same kind of questions, we have a Sena Bonida who asked, uh, uh, could you explain the different strategy for energy efficiency in tropical and subtropical climates? Should, be, should there be any differences between these two types of climates or these two types of countries? Who would like to answer this one? Maybe Wolfgang? Yeah. Can, can you hear me well? Marie, can you hear me well? Okay. Um, so, yeah, surely I think that depends very strongly on, on the sector. And um, in particular, I would say uh, when, it comes, when it comes to industrial processes, and I showed the example of the learning networks, I mean, many industrial processes are similar across uh, the different regions. Uh, of the world. I mean, cement plants uh, look similar when they are in Northern Africa or in other regions of the world. So a lot of instruments we develop uh, for that sector uh, could be similar uh, across across the world. Naturally, there are um, uh, big differences when it comes to the building sector. Uh, but at the end, um, the challenge is, is similar. I remember, for example, having looked in detail at the building in Thailand. Uh, Thailand is, uh, as you know, on average uh, at 30 degrees Celsius every uh, day, roughly. And you would expect that this country uses much less energy for buildings. But when I did the detailed calculation for the building in which I was, um, it came about that the building was exactly using the same amount of energy as a heated building in, in Europe, because the building was badly insulated, uh, the windows had no blinds to protect against the sun, and um, it was bad concrete uh, material, and overall the electricity consumption in that building uh, for the climatization was as high as if you would have a heated building, well, heated building, let's say in France, in Germany, or other regions of the world. So yes, the challenge is the same, but naturally there are a lot of differences according to the sectors. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Wolfgang. Um, Bruno, a, a question to you. Um, we, we see that improvements in energy efficiency are not forthcoming in the way they should. Uh, and uh, it's also the case for EU countries. And uh, as we have seen in the first conference of this conference cycle, um, increase in energy consumption per capita is the major driver for growth in energy, energy consumption. So uh, from this point, how do you see the evolution of energy efficiency in, um, in uh, recent trends or in the next future? Why, difficult question. <laughs> It depends also on the on the region. Uh, of course, in uh, 
in thousand countries, there, are, there is a greater potential of growth. And from one slide that uh, Laura showed, one of the indicators we are developing is what we call the decomposition uh, approach that shows what are the factors behind the growth in the consumption. And there is always an indicator of activity, which is linked to the fact there is more industrial production, more buildings, and so on. And on the other side, which is more or less offsetting the effect of activity, we have the uh, energy saving effect. And uh, in a thousand countries, the activity effect, of course, will be very, very large and is more difficult to offset uh, by energy savings than uh, in European countries where more or less so far in the past, we have managed to offset the effect of activity with the effect of uh, energy savings. I don't know if this answers the question. <laughs> I think so, and it um, probably makes a good transition also to speak about sufficiency. Uh, but first, um, there is a question from Jean-Sébastien Brock to Valérie. Um, the logic of contrasted scenarios is very interesting. To what extent could they be combined in practice? Or in other words, would there be major conflicts in the different political and social choices they represent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, th this is a question that we that is often raised to, to us. Um, I would say basically, um, no, it, it cannot be combined um, uh, because, uh, again, we, we try to have uh, an internal consistency um, for each scenario. And again, maybe let me choose one example. It's for biomass, uh, where we, we made sure that um, the use, the several types of use of biomass uh, was consistent with just the amount of available biomass. Um, and biomass can be used for, for food, biomass can be used for energy through uh, um, the, the, yeah, burning it or, uh, or using it uh, as well in uh, a methanizer. Uh, and, and biomass is also used uh, for as a sink, as a natural uh, CO2 sink. So um, we cannot really decide uh, for one use of biomass without having in mind the other types of uses. And this is just an example, but there are a lot of uh, interconnected systems like that, for instance, again, uh, between um, uh, mobility and uh, housing. Uh, you, you have to decide how you will build uh, your cities or uh, with also in mind uh, the way you organize uh, the, the transport uh, infrastructure. Thank you, Valérie. Um, so this is quite a general question and I, I think um, many of you can answer or give an answer, maybe confront various um, point of views. Um, can we first say that economic growth is inversely linked to energy consumption. Is that something that we can say? And that the, any decrease in consumption would thus lead to a decrease in GDP? And if this is the case, how can we make the energy transition desirable, especially for developing countries? So I submit this to your sagacity. <laughs> Who would like to start? Um, this one, yes, but I, I can, oh, yeah, yeah, I can start if you don't mind. Um, and in particular, because this morning actually we published uh, the uh, uh, macroeconomic um, interpretation of our four scenarios, and so you can find it in French. I'm sorry, but you can find it in French on uh, on our website. Uh, but basically, what it, it shows is that uh, all our scenarios bring growth uh, compared to today. Uh, by 2050, um, and uh, compared to uh, the business as usual scenario, of course, some scenarios are less uh, um, positive in terms of growth, uh, but still, you can you can see growth. So, I think we have to um, decorrelate uh, a necessary decrease of the consumption of goods. Um, and the conception of uh, GDP. Um, and uh, in particular, what we can uh, demonstrate through our exercise is that uh, even if you have 
um, a decrease of the consumption of goods, um, the benefits that it may create can be used uh, for uh, services or for uh, a type of consumption that is not necessarily uh, combined with um, uh, with a, with uh, uh, GHG emissions. So, yeah, in our opinion, um, it's not necessarily correlated. Um, and in addition to that, uh, the GDP is probably not the best indicator anyway uh, to uh, 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 inform about the energy transi transition. Thank you. Bruno, you, you raised your hand. Would you like to? Well, uh, the answer depends on the sector. For the household sector, this is not true. Uh, we have the example of a thousand country where despite uh, high economic growth, the energy consumption of household or consumption per capita has been decreasing over the last uh, 20 or 30 years because of the substitution for cooking uh, between biomass and uh, modern fuel. And this can also go on uh, for, for some time because substitution is not fully achieved in, in all countries. So uh, better living standards in that case doesn't mean uh, higher energy consumption, but the other way around. So the faster is the economy grows, the faster is the substitution to modern uh, cooking equipment and uh, the less the countries consume energy. Yes, Wolfgang? Yeah, if, I'm, if I may uh, add, um, uh, I think um, the climate change um, is going on more and more rapidly. And as you indicate, Marie, in, in your question, um, even if you would like to have more comfort, um, we are increasingly destroying uh, the basis of our comfort uh, and we cannot profit from, from it. So um, I think um, the, the path which uh, developing countries have uh, could, could take should not be exactly the same as ours, even if you can very much uh, advocate that they should have the same level of comfort. But in a way, um, they need to, to, to tunnel uh, to, to a different uh, state more rapidly than we did it uh, in, in our countries. And I think in the uh, questions, uh, Eva Jochen raised the interesting question about the potentials for, for energy efficiency. And I was interested uh, to look at Valerie's uh, scenarios uh, and seeing uh, even the, the scenario with um, uh, yeah, uh, the uh, sufficiency uh, approach was reducing energy consumption by one third uh, as compared to today it was interesting to see, uh, but most likely uh, in order to have a reasonable chance and Ebert Jochum was raising this question, are we, uh, do we still have potentials uh, to, to achieve? Uh, and I think this is the case and uh, R&D and also dissemination of existing technologies um, for energy efficiency in a large number of countries will help us uh, to achieve cost reduction and spreading out of these um, uh, energy efficient technologies more rapidly uh, also in uh, in the worldwide level. Thank you. Thank you. The connection is uh, almost good. <laughs> um, <about> those, <laughs> Sorry uh, for that. <laughs> the those, uh, energy savings potential and energy savings um, that are made, Laura, um, we, we see that progress in energy efficiency is often based on improved technologies but we saw that in Bruno's presentation, um, the trends are slowing down, at least in Europe. Uh, and could we imagine a case or um, when, um, is there any situations where energy efficiency levels are deteriorating or, um, or is it the contrary? When a, a progress is made, can we take it for granted? Yes. Um, a, a good example is um, during an economic recession, um, we, we can observe that uh, even we had progress before the crisis, uh, we can observe that energy efficiency um, is deteriorating in some sectors, for example, in the industrial sectors, because the industrial companies, uh, the industries are working with a lower rate, um, a lower capacity uh, rate. 
And the same can be observed in the transport sector, in the transport of goods, uh, because trucks um, uh, are driving with a, a, low, uh, a low load factor. Uh, so in this case, we can observe that energy efficiency is deteriorating uh, with, uh, with some indicators. But in reality, it doesn't mean that um, technical energy efficiency improvement are, are reducing. It's just a, a, a factor of the economic uh, recession. And many other factors can influence um, uh, indicators like uh, the rebound effect or behavior changes. I, I can take an example. If we look at the uh, space heating consumption uh, per dwelling, uh, it can reduce or it can increase. Um, and this is due to energy efficient uh, technologies, energy efficient um, heating system, but also uh, if the square meter per dwelling increase or decrease, and this is a kind of indicator of sufficiency, then it will impact also the, the, the indicator. So many factors influence um, the indicators, and this is why we really need a large set of indicators that uh, all combine uh, give a, a, a proper uh, assessment of energy efficiency and sufficiency, et cetera. Pascal, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question on, on the rebound effect. So the last time I read a, a study on this, they mentioned that um, more or less we, we have 1% every year of energy efficiency savings, but that half of it would be uh, taken back by the rebound effect, which means we heat, uh, we consume less energy to heat the flat, but people use more space. Uh, we have smaller engines uh, to drive a car or less consumption, but people buy uh, bigger cars. So, um, and this trend has been analyzed for years. The question is then, how do we, how can we implement better or get better results in energy efficiency? Is it by improving the technology or is it also by standards and by regulation to avoid that uh, this rebound effect? Because if half of the effort is eaten back, it's, uh, we miss it at the end of the day. So who wants to answer first? I can try to give some yeah. answer. It's it's complicated to answer in a in a few words because it depends on what we are talking. If we are talking about cars, uh, there is a rebound effect in the sense that uh, people buy bigger cars, and this is well documented. We have statistics who are able to quantify this effect. And one of the reasons of the slowdown of the energy efficiency progress for cars, the fact it is uh, twice slower since uh, 2014 is partly explained by the fact we have more uh, SUV uh, in the stock of cars, bigger cars. And uh, the share of SUV increased by 15 points uh, between uh, 2014 and 2019. This can be addressed by policies through uh, greater taxation. This, there is a system in France, but it has to be each time better, better designed so that it works. Uh, if the uh, bigger car are more tax, there is uh, at some level, at some point, it should uh, have an effect. But another factor which is important in the rebound effect is, is the price. If the price are high, of course, it will limit the uh, temptation to eat more dwellings or to buy bigger cars. But high price are not well seen by uh, consumers, as we can see now. Uh, and it may have a very bad effect on, on, on the living standards of people. So it's a very complex issue. But price, for, for in some area, regulation can work to remit rebound, but in other case, for instance, for heating, you cannot uh, regulate the heating in the home and only the price can have an in impact. Wolfgang, you wanted to add something? Yeah, very, very quickly. I mean, indeed, we are destroying at least half, uh, as Pascal says, of, of, of our achievements, our technical achievements of, of energy uh, consumption. Um, and I'm a bit in doubt um, if the instruments which Bruno mentioned will alone be enough to convince people 
uh, I mean, we, we know it from different countries that it's, it's, it's hard to implement. And we are currently working on a project called New Trends. Uh, and this relates a bit to this um, expression sufficiency um, uh, on, uh, of energy uses. In fact, sufficiency always has a kind of uh, notion, okay, we have to leave something which we would like to do, but we can't do it anymore because it will get more and more difficult. But in fact, New Trends implies that we are convinced um, from, from changing some of our lifestyles. Because to be honest, um, I mean, if in the course of the century we have big homes, we have big cars, and we have a lot of climate change and a lot of refugees at the end of the centuries, I'm not sure how much we can profit from our big homes and from our big cars uh, and from our industries at, at that time. So in a way, uh, convince people um, that we have to adapt our, our lifestyles to overcome these uh, these troubles, which we have to, with the rebound effects, I think that's a major path also to explore. And we don't have yet perhaps policies um, that convince people people enough, uh, as we know from France and from other countries. Thank you. So um, yeah, but yeah. Don't mind, just a quick addition to to that uh, because uh, I think indeed. Uh, that there is a combination of factors, not only uh, on taxes or regulation, but it it also there is also a need to uh, indeed to to play on uh, on lifestyle and on the cultural uh, perception of what uh, sufficiency means uh, through maybe I don't know education through uh, uh, regulating uh, adver advertisement. Uh, uh, and, and also showing uh, the potential desirability of, uh, uh, of sufficiency, which should not be only seen as a constraint. Um, so, yeah, basically, it's, it's again, it's um, uh, uh, certainly on the many different uh, factors that we can play uh, to achieve that. Thank you. So we are raising, raising the... the, the... The issue of um, maybe some conflict between sufficiency and social justice. So, and I'm asking the question to our the speakers: What are about you the necessary conditions for a fair transition, transition or just transition between north and south and within uh, one single country? Maybe uh, Wolfgang. <laughs> Any idea? Yeah, if, 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 if I may. Uh, may. May I invite you to, to I mean, switch up your important. camera? Wolfgang, could you switch Sorry. off your camera? Yeah. Yeah. Is it better? I hope. Um, yeah, it's yeah, better. Yeah, I did. I hope you can hear me. If not, uh, Marie, interrupt me if the sound is bad. Um, it's good. Uh, but um, I, I didn't uh, elaborate before on the question of distributional effects, uh, uh, in particular within a country, while um, a larger part of society can allow. Uh, and should allow, uh, to, let's say, uh, to, to, to reduce it, its uh, consumption style, others cannot or still have um, some, I would say, some right um, to consume uh, more energy or at least to have the services which uh, respond to, to a higher um, consumption of, of energy. And this is why it's important to particularly focus policies on those groups of, of the society. This is within a country, um, the, 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 the least um, uh, well-equipped uh, 5 or 10 percent, let's say, in a population. And the same holds also between North and South to develop programs uh, which are supported uh, in particular also by, by the richer countries that can promote also um, the energy efficiency part. Uh, in most countries, we have a lot uh, promoting uh, renewables in those countries, but we need even promote more the energy efficiency and also convincing people that this is something which contributes to the richness of their countries. Thank you. Thank you, Valérie. Wanted to add something? Yeah, yes, indeed. Um, well, I, I, I fully agree with uh, with Wolfgang, and um, it seems to us that for a fair uh, transition, actually, we need um, mainly three factors. Uh, I would say first is to to restore trust uh, in the in the state, and for that I think uh, uh, ideas such as uh, setting up uh, an independent body to report annually on the evaluation of actions carried out uh, for for the uh, energy transition and and uh, with which funds, how it used, and so on, um, is probably part of it. So restore restore trust. Sorry. 
Uh, another one is, is uh, in order to ensure the, the equity of the reform, it's indeed like uh, Wolfgang mentioned it, uh, to, uh, uh, to redistribute, to, to have a, a kind of compensation system, and in particular, uh, for by targeting uh, vulnerable uh, households. And, uh, and last and not least, uh, I think that the third uh, ingredient is to, to have an open governance um, in store a kind of a debate with not only uh, public parties, but also, uh, I mean, different uh, communities, social partners, social actors, uh, basically the citizens and the, and the households uh, to be part also of the, of the debate. Thank you. Any reaction, Bruno, on that point? And I think we will, um, we are almost um, over time. Um, if there are no other questions from the ground, from the floor, I would like to thank you all of our speakers um, for this very interesting debate. Of course, we would like to speak more and discuss longer, but uh, the time is a bit short. I would like also to thank um, all the people that um, join our conference cycles because uh, we see that um, people are coming back to every uh, conference. So thank you for this. And uh, don't forget that there is a last, uh, last conference next week. So uh, in a hybrid format, you can uh, be, uh, if you are in Grenoble, you can join it physically. Otherwise, uh, there would be a, a Zoom as well, a conference. And also note that this conference, so the third one that we had today, will be um, available in replay on our website. I thank you again. Thank you, Bruno, Wolfgang, Valérie, Laura. Thank you very much. And bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.